Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode in our 12-week adventure of going through the chapters of this book that I spent the 1990s writing. Um, we are on the eighth week and we will be talking about uh, chapter eight today, Implications for Everyday Systems. So in the flow of the book, the, uh, let me uh, go ahead and show you um, where we're at here. So in the flow of the book, the beginning is about abstractly what do simple programs do? What's out there in the computational universe? What we did last week was the, the sort of the bridge chapter, mechanisms and programs in nature, which is going from the things that we see in these abstract systems studied in the computational universe and how they relate to general features of things that we see in the natural world. Well, the, what we'll be doing today is talking about more specific implications for particular everyday systems. And later on, we'll be talking about uh, different things in different weeks. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about uh, a variety of different kinds of systems, but the chapter opens with a discussion of the general question of making models for things. And what does it mean to make a model for things? What does it, um, uh, um, what kinds of things should we expect from models and so on? And, the, and, and how can we make use of the raw material that we've learned from studying the computational universe in the process of making models? And one of the whole points, the, the launch point for a new kind of science was the idea that there are things to be studied in, for example, the natural world where existing kind of primitives for models, which mostly came from things like mathematical equation approaches, weren't sufficient to capture the things that were of interest in those particular kinds of systems. But one question is, when you do modeling, what does it mean? What is it, what is it, uh, what's involved in doing modeling? And the thing to understand is that when you make a model of something, you are somehow idealizing the thing. You are capturing certain essential features of the thing that you want to describe, and you're ignoring other kinds of things. So when you make a model of things, you're not trying to say where every individual atom goes. You're trying to say the things that you care about, the features that you care about, can you reproduce those features? And the thing that I consider to be the most important and one of the contributions of a new kind of science is this idea of sort of drilling down from a potentially very complex phenomenon to see the essence of what it is that sort of the essential mechanism that produces some kind of behavior, but potentially complex behavior. So uh, I say here that um, uh, it's not my purpose to explain every detail of all the various kinds of systems I discuss. In fact, to do this for even just one kind of system would most likely take at least another whole book, if not more. And in the 20 years since a new kind of science came out, indeed, people have written uh, vast amounts on specific kinds of systems that I describe here and modeling of the kind that I describe here. So in talking about modeling, um, we're, we're describing sort of what's the objective? What are we trying to get to? What, um, uh, you know, what should a model be able to describe? So you know, what I've now understood with a bit more clarity than, than I did at the time of NKS was these kind of different epochs in modeling in the course of the history of science from the sort of first epoch in antiquity of just saying the sort of structural form of models, what is this thing that we're looking at made of? Is it made of atoms? Is it made of this? Is it made of that? And then in the 1600s, the next big epoch in kind of modeling is the introduction of mathematical equations and the idea that I can describe this thing in terms of mathematical equations that I can solve for particular cases of the particular thing. So one feature of mathematical equations is they're full of numbers. And the things you get out are you're always getting numerical results. You're always saying this is 3.7, that's 8.2, and so on. So to some people, the, the success of a model is that when, the, when one thinks of a model as being primarily one of these mathematical equation type models, success is measured in do you get the number right? Do you get something where it is something where the, the, the things that can be represented in terms of numbers agree between the model and what is actually observed in the real system. And 
that's something that um, uh, is good for that epoch of modeling, for that paradigm for modeling, but often it kind of removes the point that is at least our sort of human intuitive point about a system. We'll talk a little bit about snowflake modeling. And the question is, can one, if one is making sort of a numerical type model for this with equations and so on, maybe one can capture the precise growth rate of the arms of the snowflake. But if the model says that the snowflake should be spherical, you might say, well, that's kind of a silly model. But if what your if your measure of success of the model is that you can capture this particular number, you might say it's a great success. We've got the growth rate correct, even though the snowflake is visually, for example, obviously not like a real snowflake. So one of the things that I think uh, 20 years ago, people found sort of confusing was this idea that when you're trying to capture the essence of a phenomenon, What's the right way to do that? Is it by measuring three numbers or is it by looking at a picture and saying, does this look even roughly right? The important thing, which I think has become better understood as this kind of computational paradigm for modeling has, has uh, taken more root, is that just getting the picture right is hugely important. Having the curves agree is a different kind of assessment of a model and it might be utterly misleading. And so what, um, but the first and, and most kind of obvious step is, is the picture roughly right? Is it something where even we could go in and take that picture and we can measure all kinds of properties of it and so on. We could say, yes, this has the right blobbiness or the right whatever. Um, but the main question is at the level of us intuitively, do we get more or less the right picture? So another issue about modeling is it's always controversial because somebody says, I really care about the growth rate of the snowflake. And somebody else says, well, I really care about the fact that it has these tree-like arms and it ends up being fluffy, making fluffy snow. You could have a, an accurate model of the growth rate, which is completely inaccurate in terms of the shape of the snowflake. You can have an accurate model of the shape of the snowflake that doesn't have anything to say about the growth rate. So this question of what kind of model you want, it's really very much in the eye of the model user. Sometimes that model user is more science. Sometimes that model user is technology, and the technology case is kind of more explicit in terms of do you have what you want? Do you, do you know the thing that is going to allow you to build that stack of sort of human useful technological objectives? So um, I'm talking here about uh, what, um, uh, what kind of the, um, uh, the objectives of modeling are. And um, another thing, it, um, uh, is the question of how do you know if you're right? If you make a picture and the picture looks obviously wrong, it's a bad sign. But you can, uh, one of the things that's true about models that are sufficiently simple, where the actual structure of the model is very simple, is that that's a very good situation. If you go from the very simple model that didn't contain any of the things that you were looking for in the system, and then what emerges from that model is something that looks just like the system. That's very kind of convincing that you're on the right track. You didn't kind of pick a model that's off somewhere uh, that, that is irrelevant to the actual system. Now, the sort of flip side of that is, if you have an incredibly complicated model where you're putting in all these little tweaks and all these kinds of things, um, and you say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to add this tweak because then I'll get this feature of the, of the system I'm looking at and that tweak and so on, and then you do more experiments, you say, I have to add more tweaks. That's a very bad sign for a model. A good sign for a model is the model is super simple, and yet it captures the things one cares about or some set of things that one could care about about the system one's looking at. And that's um, uh, and, and one of the things about the models in new kind of science is that they very much have this character that they're extremely simple models. So if they successfully capture things, it's a very good sign. Um, Another thing I talk about here is what it means to have a model. And you know, people sometimes would say, oh, you've got a computational model. I, I would say this confusion is very much still alive and well and rears its head even in things like the simulation argument and, and so on. The, um, but the question is, when you have a, a model based on mathematical equations, people no longer say, and maybe they never said, what do those equations run on? You know, is there a thing inside the Earth that is using Mathematica to solve differential equations to figure out where the Earth will go. Obviously not. The differential equations are just a description of how the Earth behaves. 
Now, in fact, in the earlier parts of history, when people, before people started looking at mathematical equations, there was a much more mechanical view of sort of how things should work and whether it's sort of the angels pushing the earth around its orbit and things like this. And then mathematical equations came in and said, no, there's just this abstract description. So with programs, they have the misfortune in a sense to actually be implementable explicitly on computers. So it then becomes the question of when you have a program-based model, maybe you might say there's got to be a computer running it. But actually, programs are a much more abstract concept, just like mathematical equations. They're something which abstractly can be discussed, abstractly exists, abstractly can be studied. And you don't have to say, on what computer did you happen to run that? You might choose to run it on a particular computer to do some simulation, but that's not intrinsic to the model itself. So, okay, and, and we're discussing here the question of whether there is a, when you look inside the model, is it kind of a black box where you just say, yes, I run this model and I get the right answer, or is it something where you say, well, I've got, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at, um, uh, I look at this thing, and when I look inside the model, the mechanism of the model agrees with the mechanism of the system itself. That's essentially another level of modeling. Do you get just the output? You'll never get all the mechanism the same, because obviously your model is just an idealization of the system itself. So the mechanism of the model will never be identical to the mechanism of the system itself. By the way, I should put a footnote on all of these things. All of the things I'm saying about modeling here and idealization are true until you come to the ultimate model, the model of fundamental physics, the model of the universe, which, of course, we've now been working on very intensively for the last couple of years. And for that model, I will not say that what one's dealing with is an idealization of what's going on. What one's dealing with is the low level of what's actually going on sort of all the way down. It's, it's computation kind of all the way down. So, but in the kinds of models that I describe in chapter eight, these are models, it's, it's called implications for everyday systems. It's not about fundamental physics. Chapter nine is about fundamental physics. This is about everyday systems at a level of modeling where one is not having the situation that one really is looking at the lowest level machine code of the universe. Here we're dealing with models which are operating at a, at a much higher level where it's just sort of an effective description of what's going on. We're talking about packets of ice and things like this. We're not talking about the low level atoms of space from which a hundred orders of magnitude up, you might be able to make uh, sort of um, uh, water molecules and all those kinds of things. So uh, one of the things about modeling I, I talk about here um, is, uh, um th that um you uh, this question about what effects do you pick out and in a sense often the progress of making models of things or even the creation of new sciences new directions in science has to do with noticing oh there's this thing that i can identify that i care about in some particular system it's actually somewhat related to the things that we're studying now about observers um this concept that there is an intrinsic I mean, this is now segueing to a, a sort of a more a view of this that's kind of 20 years after NKS um, is kind of the Rouliad and the fact that different observers of the Rouliad kind of are extracting different kinds of science from this underlying computational structure, just as we discussed extracting physics, extracting mathematics from this underlying structure. These are sort of different kinds of science that can be extracted from that same underlying structure. but. Um, the, uh, the thing that often is the defining feature of a new science is identifying what can you measure, you know, in economics, what can you measure overall flows of money, let's say, uh, in something like, um, uh, in, in all sorts of different areas uh, of social science or whatever else, there's kind of what can you measure? What can you start talking abstractly about? What is not just the particulars of a situation? What is something about which you can provide some kind of uh, modeling, some meta model of what's going on that is capable of abstract discussion? So that's kind of the, um, the, the this question about what's important. That's the defining thing. That's the first step you have to have in modeling things. What's important? What do you care about? And as I say, that can always be controversial. Because one group of people can say, well, we don't care about the things you care about, and so on. Sometimes technology is the big sort of determiner, 
of what do you really in fact care about? You know, you could be discussing something about uh, the flow of fluid over, over different shapes and so on and so on and so on. And then you try to make an airplane and what you actually care about is the lift and drag on the airplane. And so all of those little beautiful pictures of, of vortices flowing in this or that way, that's all well and good. But in the end, the technology in that particular case just cares about, let's say, the lift and drag on the airplane. Um, but so so that's a, that's that's an issue there. Um, let's see. The uh, I talk a little bit in in um, in the book here about uh, uh, I talk about the fact that over the years I've been able to watch the progress of perhaps a dozen significant models that I've constructed, though in most, most cases never published for a variety of kinds of systems with complex behavior. And in fact, many of those models I describe in chapter eight. I'm talking about the things that I saw happen in the 1980s to 1990s. So uh, as I say here, the initial response to these models is usually in great surprise that such simple models could yield behavior that's even roughly right. But experts in the particular types of systems involved have usually been quick to point out that there are many details that my models do not correctly reproduce. Then after an initial period where the models are often said to be too simplistic to be worth considering, there begin to be all sorts of extensions added that attempt to capture more effects and more details. The result is that after a few years, my original models have evolved into models that are almost unrecognizably complex. But these models have often been used with great success for many practical purposes. And at that point with their success established, it sometimes happens that the models are examined more carefully and uh, um, and then it's discovered that many of the extensions that were added were in fact quite unnecessary. So that in the end, after perhaps a decade has passed, it becomes recognized that models equivalent to the simple ones I originally proposed do indeed work quite well. I'd kind of forgotten that I'd said that here, but it's really quite amusing to me to see that the things that I describe in chapter eight, the exact same thing has happened to almost all of the things that were described in chapter eight and the timescale of a decade is more or less right. The, um, uh, I also comment here, that um, one might have thought that in the literature of traditional science, new models would be proposed all the time. But in fact, the vast majority of what's done in practically every field involves not developing new models, but rather accumulating experimental data or working out consequences of existing models. So, and, and I, you know, I talk about the fact that, well, okay, you know, how are you gonna make new models? If you need to make a hundred new models in a year, what raw material are you going to use for those models? By the way, 100 new models would be a fantastically huge number. That would be more models than define a typical field of science. Um, so, uh, and, and I talk about the fact that basically programs are the new raw material for models, and that's what um, and that's what NKS is is uh, is about. So, okay, let's go back to the. Um, we're going to launch into. Uh, um, uh, going to launch into actual systems, uh, implications for everyday systems is the title of this chapter, and we're going to launch into actually talking about particular systems. So the first one I talk about is the growth of crystals. So what is a crystal? A crystal is a regular array of atoms laid out very much like the cells in cellular automaton. Liquid uh, crystals form solids when liquids or gases are cooled below their freezing points. So crystals always start from a seed. Uh, more often, quite, quite often, it can be a foreign object like a grain of dust, and then grow by adding atoms to their surface. So let's look at this cellular automaton here that works that way. This is a two-dimensional cellular automaton, and what we're doing here is um, uh, just looking at um, uh, just looking at the growth starting from a single cell seed. This is on a square grid. This is on a hexagonal grid. And this is a very simple crystal that's forming here, here uh, square, here hexagonal. Okay, so that's the most straightforward kind of crystal. And, and indeed one sees those kinds of crystals in, in nature, epitaxial growth crystals, but not all crystals work that way. And in particular, uh, snowflakes are an example of ones which have a characteristic shape that isn't just this kind of, uh, um, just this shape that is kind of faceted shape. Instead, they have a dendritic tree-like shape. And so those are some examples of snowflake pictures. You see sometimes you get hexagons, sometimes you get these more elaborate kinds of patterns with, with various kinds of, uh, uh, of tree-like pieces poking out. Okay, so why does this happen? Well, this is where we get to start talking about 
what is the most sort of fundamental model for what's going on here. The fundamental reason this happens is because when ice, uh, when water vapor condenses into ice on the surface of a snowflake, when that water vapor condenses, it releases a small amount of heat, latent heat. And that means that that particular place on the, on the snowflake where one packet of ice condensed, the, uh, the, uh, uh, after it's condensed, there's a period of time before the heat has kind of dissipated away when there's inhibition to growth at that same point. So how can you capture that? Well, let's look at a very simple cellular automaton, and let's say that the rule is that at each step, you can grow, you can add a new cell when there's exactly one neighbor that was black on the cell before. But when there's more than one neighbor, you assume that there's, there was um, too much heat was deposited there, and therefore you're going to uh, inhibit growth on the next step. So if you just follow that rule, this is the behavior that you get. This is the sequence of, of steps in a two-dimensional cellular automaton on a hexagonal grid. And these are the kinds of patterns that you get. Now, what happens is you grow arms, then the arms grow into each other, and it fills back into a hexagon again. This happens repeatedly. And you can see that there are kind of scars from where the arms join together. And so now you go back and look at the actual snowflakes. And by golly, there are scars in the interior of the snowflake that you can see here. And in fact, what you realize is those scars are just the same scars that you see in this, uh, in this kind of very simple model of snowflake growth. So in a sense, what we've been able to do here is capture the essential feature of the snowflake growth that leads to the existence of arms in the first place, the, the rejoining of arms, the scars from previous arms that exist in the interior of the snowflake. So this is a quite successful example of kind of uh, uh, using simple programs as a model for um, uh, for these kinds of systems. Um, the uh, um, I think okay, so that's that's kind of at the at sort of the the, the level of. Um, uh, so we, we seem to have successfully captured with that simple cellular automaton. If you say, why is snowflake, why is snow fluffy? And why are uh, snowflakes, you know, have this tree-like structure? I think we can say, we know why that happens. The, in, the reason is growth inhibition. You play out the growth inhibition, even in this very simple model, you get that phenomenon, you get the consequences of that phenomenon, like the sort of the scars from the interior of the hexagonal snowflakes and so on. And we can say that that's a success in, in modeling at the level of understanding the fundamental phenomenon of the complexity of snowflakes. And that was an early motivating uh, example for me back in the early 1980s uh, for studying uh, cellular automata and things like that in the first place. Now one can ask, OK, so that's the basic scheme. What about other forms of growth that one might get? Let's say that instead of saying that there's just a single black cell that um, you uh, on which which leads to growth, what about some other kinds of things that lead to growth? And what you see here is a variety of other kind of patterns of growth that um, would be uh, would be um, uh, would be relevant would would occur with different kind of underlying rules. Now, do these occur in nature? I don't know. Not sure if anybody knows. Because if you saw a, a kind of a, a growth of an object that looked like that, it would be hard to, to conclude. People would have a hard intuitive time saying, oh, there must be a simple rule that leads to that. It just looks like a blob of stuff. And I certainly looked at a whole bunch of crystals and so on to try to understand, are there cases where you get sort of blobs like this? And could it be the case that there is, in fact, a simple underlying rule? I think we still don't know the answer to that question. I might say, when it comes to dendritic growth, um, and why one cares about dendritic growth. Yes, there are things like, you know, avalanches in snow are more likely if it's a bunch of hexagons that slide easily than a bunch of fluffy pieces of snow that have arms that, that um, sort of get tangled up with each other. It's also something which in modern times, in the effort to make more and more efficient batteries, uh, dendritic growth is the thing that occurs that kind of limits the, the uh, often limits kind of the performance of batteries as it leads to kind of shorting inside the battery and so on as this kind of growth occurs. So it's something one cares about. Okay, well, so uh, let's see. Um, 
let's look at the notes for this section. So I talk about the whole question of whether there are in fact identical snowflakes. And the answer is, well, uh, yes, there are in fact identical snowflakes. The reason that one thinks they're not identical is that, that uh, they, they originate at different places in clouds. And then there's a path by which the snowflakes are delivered to you. And that path involves going through, for example, turbulent flow in the atmosphere, which tends to make uh, two snowflakes, even if they started from nearby places, end up, or the, the snowflakes that arrive in a particular place may have started from many places that weren't so nearby. I talk about um, uh, what people understood about the history of crystal growth um, and uh, the idea that from the 1700s that, that the, the simplicity of crystals was somehow a reflection of an underlying atomic structure. I talk about hopper crystals, which are a rather lovely example. I, I um, Something I actually did experiments on in, in the NKS book, this is bismuth. And um, bismuth crystals form very quickly. You can kind of heat them up in a in a regular kind of um, a cooking temperature type um, uh, type situation, and you get liquid bismuth, and you let it um, crystallize out quickly, and you get these kind of very elaborate patterns here. And this is just a um, a discussion of um, of how those patterns arise, and the fairly fairly simple this hoppering shapes um, that uh, arise there. Um, more rapid growth at the edges than at the center of each face. So that's just kind of a description of those kinds of things. Um, talk about polycrystalline materials, talk about, um, uh, okay, these are amorphous materials like glasses and so on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing the same thing that I keep on doing is going down the left column and that's wrong. I should be going left, right, left, right. Uh, all right, let's do that. Snowflake studies. Um, there's uh, Kepler was famous for having uh, written um, a little book about um, uh, snowflakes in 1611. Um, all sorts of people looked at them. Uh, and um, uh, it's something where I think there's some recent work that's being done on snowflake growth. Models of crystal growth. Okay, so this is about um, uh, the, the kind of what happens, uh, dif different kinds of, um, of effects that had been discovered um, you know, exactly how do atoms fit onto a surface, how do you get dislocations on the surface, these kinds of things, the effect of thermodynamics. These are things that are very much in the mathematical equations tradition and that discuss kind of uh, detailed phenomena about numbers that come out from snowflake growth. These really aren't terribly relevant to this question of what's the fundamental cause of dendritic crystals, for example. But that's what's addressed by the models that we're, we're dealing with here. Um, Okay, this is talking about generalizations of those cellular automata. It's talking about quasi-crystals. I think I talked about those a little bit before. Um, other kinds of phenomena, this is just diffusion-oriented aggregation, um, different way to grow uh, randomly, to grow kind of uh, dendritic kinds of forms. Um, in the end, the, the cause, although it is somewhat more obscurely presented, the cause is the same kind of growth inhibition phenomenon. Um, Okay, this is about boiling, a uh, slightly different issue. This is about kind of why you get this sort of random collection of bubbles um, when you see a liquid, for example, boiling. These are simple models based on continuous cellular automata for that. Okay, well, so that was a little bit on crystal growth. Let's go back to the, the section. Next section was about the breaking of materials. It's really about how come cracks are, look random. And so there's a, there's a question of how, how do cracks form and why do cracks not just go straight? For example, in a crystal, why does a crack not just go boom, straight through the crystal? Now, actually, I, in, in, in working on this, I um, uh, definitely did some experiments. I got some pure silicon crystals. I broke them. I got looked at them. I got somebody to look at them for me under an electron microscope. And the basic story is, it's, it's kind of random looking all the way down. I'm not sure if I have a picture here of how that works. Um, uh, I talk about the fact that ductile materials tend to be less jagged. Uh, brittle materials tend to be uh, have these jagged faces. Um, 
and uh, this question of sort of how that works at a microscopic level of sort of atoms with springs connecting them. And when the, the displacement between atoms gets too large, then the spring breaks, so to speak. Uh, there's the, a lot of stuff about the history of, of, um, of studying fract fracture um, and uh, the importance of sort of crack formation and things like metal fatigue and so on recognized in the, in the 50s and so on. Um, let's see. Uh, talking about large scale cracks in geology versus small scale cracks and so on. But the basic, and then talking about electric breakdown, um, when you have you know, a lightning strike or something like this, uh, what leads to the jaggedness of that kind of thing? Um, this is a somewhat irrelevant piece about the crushing of solids um, and the uh, um, question of, of whether you can detect the randomness, the, the, the sort of jaggedness of the surface of a solid um, in terms of the friction force and why it is the case this remains somewhat mysterious why the friction force is linearly proportional to the normal force, the force with which you push the object down, um, and uh, how does that relate to kind of the randomness of things, uh, crinkling of paper, those kinds of things. Okay, so what was the basic model um, that we were looking at here? Uh, the basic idea had to do with, has to do with, kind of um, uh, how, as the crack forms, how the effect of the position of the crack feeds back to where the next piece of crack will form. And this is kind of describing the, the way that, um, uh, it's sort of a question here, insofar as the cracks look random, where does that randomness come from? Is that randomness somehow a deterministic randomness? Is that randomness from, the, the structure of the material, or is it from something else? And, and by, by breaking some pure silicon crystals, one can tell it's not the structure of the material because the atoms are perfectly uh, lined up there. Um, I think that what's happening, and, and this is kind of a, a model that was not, not fully developed here, has to do with the idea that pieces of the crack, when a crack is formed, the, the, the very fact that a crack is there has an effect on the other parts of the material and on the propensity to crack in a particular place. And so what I'm trying to do here is to capture that with a cellular automaton and to have the path of the crack be determined by essentially a mobile automaton that's running on top of the cellular automaton to determine where the actual crack will form. It's a, it's a rather simple model, but it may capture the essence of what's going on in crack formation and the way that sort of one element of the crack sort of feeds forward to have an effect on, on subsequent elements uh, in which the crack will occur. I would say that this is one of the less developed models that I have in NKS, and I, I'm kind of wondering, and I don't know I, I'm, uh, how much more development. I think there has been some more development done along these lines. Okay, so let's go on to the next section. So we've talked about crystal growth. We've talked about cracking um, and fracture. Let's talk about fluid flow. Fluid flow is a very important example and um, one that uh, sort of over and over again keeps on showing up over and over again as a source of intuition and as a way to kind of get a sense of what's possible and what's not. So what are some typical forms of fluid flow? Here are some pictures of, of actual fluid flow. There's some um, uh, fluid flow that is very laminar, that is very smooth and in layers. Um, there's fluid flow in which there are lots of vortices produced. There are two attached vortices um, behind a cylinder. This is a vortex street where there are su succession of vortices released um, as fluid flows past a cylinder. And in other cases, things get much more random. Uh, one gets, uh, you know, the, the red spot on Jupiter is essentially a, a vortex. And behind that vortex, as the, as the atmosphere flows around it, a whole collection of other vortices formed. Um, again, at the, the, the rough kind of phenomenology of what happens in fluid flow, if you're flowing past a cylinder, at low speeds, the fluid will just sort of slide around the cylinder. At slightly higher speeds, you'll start seeing these eddies develop behind the cylinder, but they're still attached behind the cylinder. As you go to higher speeds, the eddies will progressively detach, and you will get this vortex street as left, right, left, right eddies detach. And then there is a transition to this mysterious phenomenon called turbulence, where the eddies are no longer regularly being 
being coming out in a, in a regular kind of uh, equal period kind of form, but instead you're getting this sort of much more random structure to the fluid. And a big question is, where does that randomness come from? You know, when you form a, when you make a splash, for example, where does the randomness of a splash come from? Sometimes a hydraulic jump, for example, that's a shock front that's very, very regular. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, convection cells when there isn't too much heating, also very regular. But the question is, where does um, uh, where does the randomness when there is turbulence or a splash or something like that, where does that randomness come from? I'd forgotten this page. There's a lot of nice pictures on this page. Uh, okay, so let's make a sort of low-level model for what's going on. Well, let's imagine that fluid flow can be modeled by thinking about little packets of fluid and what they do. You could think about this as the level of individual molecules, but it's going to do the same thing. A whole packet of molecules is going to do the same thing. And so the level we're talking about is an individual one. So what we're saying is there are certain... Uh, there are these packets, and the packets have a velocity, just like fluid has a certain velocity locally at a particular point. And we say there are some rules that at every step, we're going to attach those velocities to this discrete grid. At every step, when there is a collision, you collide, you conserve the number of, of, of particles here, and you also conserve the momentum of the particles. The sum of the vectors of the arrows is conserved. And so you have these, in this particular case, you have these particular rules that conserve number density and conserve momentum. And then the question is, well, what does that, what does that do then? Well, here's an example where we've got, a, uh, we've got a net flow. We've set things up so that there's a net flow from left to right. So the velocity vectors point here from, uh, from left to right. And then we put this obstruction in the flow. And we can see here we've arranged so that the molecules, when they hit the obstruction, they bounce off it and so on. And the question is, well, what does that then look like? What does that do on a large scale when we look at the overall velocities of clumps, the coarse grain velocities of clumps of these particles? Well, what we get is actually a couple of vortices here. Now, if we, if we go to a reference frame in which the, um, the fluid is on average standing still and the plate is moving through it, we see that there are these two attached eddies behind the plate. Well, isn't that cool? So effectively, we've got, uh, we could have started to write down the whole partial differential equations for, for fluid flow. But in this case, what we've done is we've just tried to capture the essence of fluid flow by looking at just this number conservation, momentum conservation, these sets of rules. So what can happen with that? Well, um, let's see. Here's what happens as you increase the speed of flow. So at first you have these attached eddies, and then they start, actually, this is, this is sorry, this one is, is at a higher speed. This is just successive time steps. First, you have these attached eddies, then they start to break off, they keep going, and eventually you start to see that these eddies have complicated interactions with each other, and you're starting to see some randomness in the wake of that cylinder. So this, is, uh, so this is kind of a very minimal model for fluid flow that reproduces uh, some of what one sees in actual fluid flow. How accurate is it? Hard to tell. But is it capturing the essence of what's going on? It looks like it is. Now, when I was first working on things like this in the mid-1980s, um, I spent a lot of time talking to people who did sort of standard computational fluid dynamics the, from taking the continuum Navier-Stokes equations and sort of making them discrete and breaking them down into something you could digest on a computer. And they always had a very hard time, for example, knowing where the randomness came from when they saw randomness. They didn't know whether that was the breakdown of their numerical scheme or whether that was a genuine phenomenon. So in this case, we don't have any breakdown of numerical schemes. We've, you know, we've got bits that are just doing what bits do. And then the question is, well, what then is the, is the behavior that you get from that? Um, and the, the big thing that I was pretty uh, interested in was this question of when you see turbulence, when you see randomness in fluid flow, where does the randomness come from? Does it come by sort of coming from the level of individual molecules and sort of the heat associated with those molecules? Or does it come from some intrinsic process that's more like computer than digits of pi? And um, uh, indeed, what this tends to suggest is, yes, it comes from an intrinsic process rather than from one of these sort of extrinsic sources. And also, you can ask, is there a central dependence on initial conditions? If you change one of those underlying particles, does it affect the wake? Most of the time, it does not.
Okay, so in this section, let me just see what I was. There's another page here. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I discuss some um, a bunch of sort of aspects of um, of how uh, of of what the what the sort of real source of randomness in in fluid flow actually is and and what level of modeling you need in order to reproduce that that's an extremely simple cellular automaton that captures certain l you know certain essence of what we saw in the fluid flow pictures before but it doesn't get it as close to sort of the intuitive version of fluid flow um as as we had thought here uh, as as some um, uh uh, you know, th those things make a bridge between what we kind of intuitively see as fluid flow and what's happening with these underlying models. Okay, let's take a look at the notes for this section. Oh boy, lots of notes. Well, I'm talking about Reynolds numbers. That's the kind of the measure of when I say the fluid is flowing faster, it's faster relative to the size of things and so on. There's a dimensionless number that characterizes fluid flow. Um, I probably I might talk about oh I do I talk about um, uh, what happens in different Reynolds numbers and Reynolds numbers of on the order of a hundred is where typical transition to turbulent flow occurs. But the Reynolds number, whether it you can scale things up, the velocity an airplane that's very big moving at a certain speed has a Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is the the velocity times the length divided by the kinematic viscosity. That's essentially the, the rate of frictional uh, dissipation of, uh, of effects. And in general, the Reynolds number kind of measures the ratio of inertial effects, just sort of fluid turning to dissipative effects. That is the viscosity kind of damping out what's happening in the fluid. So uh, that's a discussion of Reynolds numbers. Talk about the Navier-Stokes equations, which are the kind of uh, typical equations that are used for um, uh, to describe continuum fluid mechanics. Uh, they are very nasty equations, and there's much not known about them. The question of whether they will blow up in finite time, whether the solutions can blow up in finite time, whether you can always deduce the solution based on initial conditions, this stuff is all not known yet. It's been uh, 100 and, oh, 180 years, and uh, we're still uh, uh, we still don't know those things about the Navier-Stokes equations. They're nasty, complicated equations. And uh, in the end, uh, it may be better to describe fluids in terms of something that builds up from these simple cellular automaton models uh, on which you know that you can do computations rather than working down from these Navier-Stokes equations, which are derived from kind of arguments about how uh, fluids should flow in the continuum limit. Well, uh, there's all these questions about, um, uh, yeah, I talk about the next order corrections to the Navier-Stokes equations that I worked out in cellular automata. Um, I talk about the fact that in hypersonic flow, by Mark IV or so, four times the speed of sound, shocks are typically so sharp that changes occur in less than the distance between molecular condition, con collisions, making it essential to go beyond the continuum fluid approximation. So that's um, that's sort of how things how you start seeing below the continuum description. Now, we're very interested right now in doing the same kind of thing for space-time because the emergence of the Einstein equations works in very much the same way as the emergence of the Navier-Stokes equations from these discrete cellular automata is like the emergence of the Einstein equations for our hypergraph rewriting system. And so to know what is the analog of hypersonic flow, it's kind of space-time singularities of various kinds. How do, we, how do we set up a situation in which we can experimentally perhaps, or at least in astronomy, physical experiments um, see the effect of going beyond the continuum limit and validate the idea that space is in fact discrete. So, okay, I talk about modeling of turbulence and uh, the fact that, well, not a lot is known. There are various kinds of arguments, uh, you know, people like Leonardo da Vinci was already drawing pictures in the 1500s of turbulent flows. And typically it's like big eddies turn into smaller eddies and they turn into still smaller eddies until eventually the eddies are small enough that they get damped up by viscosity. That's kind of a qualitative picture, but um, uh, how that really works um, is, uh, is something that still remains to be, to be fully clarified. Uh, I talk here about, about chaos theory and turbulence, the idea that sensor dependence on initial conditions occurs. And the basic answer is it occurs sometimes, but only when things have happened to be on kind of a knife edge situation. Um, more commonly, 
one just dissipates out the effects of small perturbations due to uh, through viscosity. Um, and so the idea that somehow the fact that some small, small perturbation can lead to a big effect, it simply doesn't explain the randomness that we see in turbulence. That's simply just a sort of sideshow to that phenomenon. And uh, confusing though that is sometimes to people, um, that there really is that there's sort of a fundamentally different phenomenon that really is the kind of NKS story of all of this um, that's different from what one might think about from sort of the sensor independence on initial conditions. Oh boy, I talk here about what's known about specific, uh, uh, this is the, the dynamics of actual eddies flowing around uh, cylinders and so on. And in a sense, this, this doesn't reveal how much kind of field work and other sort of experimental type work I did to try to understand how these systems work. I was, visited wind tunnels. I tried my own experiments. I did all kinds of things like this to just try and make sure that I actually knew what I was talking about in terms of uh, what actually happens in, in fluid flow. Talking about the red spot of Jupiter, which is a more of a two-dimensional phenomenon. Um, okay, I think this is probably um, uh, details about uh, cellular automaton fluids, the idea of uh, basing, you know, what should you look at in a fluid? Is it velocity or is it vorticity? Um, cellular automaton fluids, um, the history, early hard sphere gas models, um, things I did back when I was a kid, 1973 or so, um, I made actually uh, sort of unwittingly, in a sense, made my first cellular automaton fluid model. Didn't turn out to be all that interesting. Um, it took until the mid-1980s before I made one that really works. Uh, talking about computational fluid mechanics, um, boy, there's some good notes here. Somebody should lift these notes and stick them in Wikipedia and so on. Uh, this, is about, um, uh, this is about sound waves. And just looking at, uh, and we're looking at fluid flow, we're looking at the velocity of a fluid. For sound waves, we're just looking at the number density of the fluid, the density of particles. And we can see there's a nice sound wave, which even on a hexagonal grid here, we get basically a circular sound wave. This is about shock fronts. This is about when you have things that go, there's a speed of sound defined here, which is kind of one cell per step. And as you go faster than that, you start seeing these shock fronts produced, and you see these very geometrical looking shocks. Uh, kind of like you see very geometrical looking shocks when you are looking at the supersonic plane or, or anything like that. Um, I talk about splashes. Yes, I tried to figure out a lot about splashes. I tried to find out what a splash was like in zero gravity. I asked various astronauts about it. They said, you don't want to do a splash in zero gravity because it'll leave random little bits of water all over the space station. And that's, that's super bad. Um, but in any case, trying to understand um, what leads to the randomness in a splash. And we know a certain amount about that. Uh, talking about um, convection, uh, fluid flow driven by temperature differences, uh, talking about turbulence in the atmosphere and um, um, how that works. Ocean surfaces, a whole nother story, which I didn't really get into in NKS. I, again, I looked at that. Uh, many of these notes, which end up being three lines long, were a heck of a lot more than three lines in terms of the amount of work that I did on them and eventually just decided, look, I'm not gonna talk about this in the NKS book. Somebody will get to this later and indeed people have and almost all of these. Um, ocean surfaces being a different case. I talk about granular materials like sand and how, that, um, how you get fluid flow there. Okay, this is about geological structures. I was going to have a section in NKS about this. I ended up deciding I didn't have enough to say about it. Um, this is about sort of how, how different kinds of patterns form. Um, for example, uh, how erosion produces can produce very uh, either smooth patterns or very elaborate patterns where you get, you know, the fjords of Norway after a sufficiently long time, or you get sort of the, the smooth coastlines of other places um, and how that works. And I think there's, a, there's nice models. In fact, people have made these models using kind of program-based models. Um, have made models of erosion in this kind of way. Um, okay, so that was a little bit on fluid flow, an important area, an important example of um, uh, looking at um, uh, of, of systems that we can study using using simple programs and using the paradigm of new kind of science.
Okay, well, having looked at some of these physical systems in chapter eight, I then turned to looking at biology. And I have basically three sections that discuss biology. And the first one is about fundamental issues in biology. And biology is full of complexity. And the question is, where does that complexity come from? Does it come because, uh, in a sense, people were, were seeking, you know, where could complexity come from? It wasn't, people assumed that complexity was hard to get. You had to go to a lot of effort to get complexity. And that's why, for example, when Darwinian evolution came along, people were like, okay, that must be the mechanism for this complexity. There's all this work that's been done in all of these uh, progression of billions of years of natural selection. That's the work that got done. Uh, as opposed to kind of previous theories of natural theology and things like this, where, you know, it was uh, the supernatural being did the work, so to speak, because it goes beyond what you could expect to have happen from anything that's sort of tolerably simple to produce. That intuition is wrong. The intuition that you can't have simple rules that give complicated behavior, that's one of the results of new kind of sciences, that intuition is wrong. You can have simple rules that produce complex behavior. And now the question is, when we look at biology, to what extent is it the case that the complexity of biology is the result of the application of simple rules? And to what extent is it something different? For example, a long series of engineering hacks that have been assembled. Well, so, uh, Let's look at some evidence. Okay, so I have this array, this picture that shows some biological forms, different kinds of things, pollen grains, uh, radiolarians um, from plankton, uh, uh, all kinds of different um, creatures, uh, you know, trilobites, uh, wasps' nests, barnacles, uh, sea urchins, and so on. Okay. What's in common between these pictures? Well, these pictures all have a certain visible regularity to them. They all seem like it's plausible that they could have been made by simple rules, even though this, this broccoli, for example, here has a very elaborate form. It's still the case that um, one, it looks as if uh, the, um, uh, it's plausible that this could have been made by simple rules or this, the scepter in an ammonite, by the way, in a, in a kind of a, these pictures were mostly taken specifically for the NKS book. And um, uh, some, a couple of the people who worked on this, all the people who worked on this are, are still um, working at our company. And I was just talking to uh, some of them recently and they were discussing who got to eat the broccoli that this is a picture of. And we know the answer to that question. Um, so, okay. So this kind of gives some sort of sense that maybe there can be simple programs that lead to biological forms. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what those programs might be and so on. I think I, I talk about well, I talk about the role of evolution in biological evolution relative to sort of the mechanics of um, uh, of what goes on. And, and this question about how you make a trade-off between what is something that just sort of ha works that way because of the mechanics of the growth of an organism and what is carefully tuned that way by the process of biological evolution. And that's kind of a theme in this section is to what extent is the fundamental abstract dynamics of simple programs, what is responsible for the essence of what we see in biology and to what extent is it the engineering hackery of a billion years of evolution. And what I argue is that many of the most spectacular examples of complexity in biology are in fact of an NKS kind. They're things where it's a simple rule and just by the abstract nature of what simple rules do, you get complex behavior. It is not behavior that has been tuned by sort of the, the efforts of evolution, so to speak. Uh, so there's, there's sort of a discussion here about the, the role of constraints and the extent to which when complexity is free, you just get complexity from simple rules all the time. And some of those examples of complexity will turn out to be things where the where it spells eat me or something on the animal, and then that's probably not something that's going to survive. But in other cases, it's something where sort of the complexity is free and the constraints operating on that complexity might actually be quite simple constraints. But because 
one of the branches of what could happen was something that leaded to lots of complexity and the constraints did not distinguish. The constraints weren't sort of going in and microscopically looking at the details of what happened because those constraints uh, were in a sense coarse constraints. Um, the, the complexity arises and can just be there because of the actual development of the organism. I, th I suppose it's a little bit like, as we now understand things about observers and so on, this is like saying, well, maybe biological evolution is a very blunt instrument. Maybe the constraints it has mostly are very blunt. And all this detail that can get filled in by the particular dynamics of growth is not, is not squashed by, by the biological evolution. It's not like, oh gosh, you know, you don't want to have something as elaborate as something like this. Biological evolution is gonna smooth it out. It doesn't bother because that works just fine. It's a kind of a neutral with respect to biological evolution. So evolution leaves it, but that complexity is arising because of the intrinsic dynamics of the particular system that we're looking at here. Okay, so I talk about in general about these kinds of things. And I talk about the idea of the question of sort of whether there's a theory of biology um, that is, is around sort of the abstract behavior of simple systems and at what, uh, what those do, and whether one can say whether the force of kind of abstract behavior exceeds kind of what biological evolution achieves. Because if it does, then we have a, a fundamental abstractly defined theory of biological complexity, independent of the sort of particular twists and turns that were taken by biological evolution. Now, actually, I think with our whole multi-computation paradigm, there's kind of a new and different way to think about this that perhaps will work out over the next few months. This is an example of kind of what, what the evolution of a genotype the rules for a cellular automaton do how as you progressively change one bit in the rules for the cellular automaton how does that affect the behavior you get and sometimes it has no effect at all in these particular cases and then suddenly you start getting this complexity here between this and this and then you more or less hang on to that complexity as you change the rules and maybe eventually you go back to something that doesn't have so much complexity and so on but Essentially, what, what's happening here is we're seeing in the space of possible programs in the genotypes from which we generate phenotypes that are the behavior of the program. This is sort of the typical uh, kind of thing that you see is kind of a, a, a sort of a punctuated equilibrium-ish kind of thing where there's um, uh, not much change and then suddenly you change the critical bit and then you start getting... Uh, you start getting um, a more elaborate behavior that is somewhat robust with respect to the genotype um, and, and eventually changes. Uh, okay, let's see. So, well, there's some, um, there's a lot of detailed stuff here about kind of how to think about the philosophy of modeling um, for, uh, uh, for, for in biology and the extent to which kind of constraints in what sometimes get called developmental constraints. But I think, um, uh, by, by the way, the whole idea of the evo-devo, you know, evolution development kind of dichotomy uh, was something that was kind of beginning to emerge in the 1980s. And, and I was, uh, uh, had lots to say about that. Um, that has become more understood in the last 20 years uh, since the NKS book, I think it's probably worth actually going back and looking, uh, I'm sure many people have done this, at what was actually said in the NKS book about this, because I suspect it's, it's. Uh, I haven't done that for this section, um, and I suspect there's there's quite interesting things here. Um, uh, and, you know, to what extent, you know, to what extent biological evolution inexorably leads to complexity? I don't think it does. I don't think it's where, it's where the complexity of biology emerges from. I think the vast majority of at least certain kinds of, of local complexity is from this phenomenon of uh, complex behavior from simple rules. Um, this is a lot of stuff about... Uh, about the analogy between the history of technology and the fossil record and kind of the Cambrian explosion in the fossil record and its relationship to things that happen in, in technology um, and uh, uh, how that all works. Okay, let's look back at the notes for this previous section.
and then we'll go on and look at some more details. Um, okay, history of biological complexity. That's a bunch of things about um, uh, natural selection and so on. Um, and, and the controversy that's continued about, you know, how does natural selection manage to make all the complexity see, we see in biology? Well, the basic answer is it doesn't. That isn't the phenomenon that's leading to most of this. And so a lot of the, you know, people saying it's the science, it's just natural selection. It's, I'm afraid, one of those science overreach situations where there's more to it. It's more complicated. And the reason, but, you know, part of the reason people say, look, it can't possibly be right, is that, well, actually what they see does go beyond that. And the story of what goes beyond that is very much the story of what NKS is, is talking about. Um, by the way, the, the, the very term cellular automaton made lots of people in biology, particularly in the 80s, uh, more interested than they might otherwise have been. And, and, and lots of things got, got figured out as a result of that. Uh, talking about the form of, um, um, of uh, the genome and so on, talking about um, uh, tricks in biological evolution and sort of evolve, evolving to be evolvable and things like this. Um, this whole idea, which I, I think one doesn't hear quite so much these days, about how natural selection, I mean, even 20 years ago, this was a very prevalent view, that natural selection has uh, is the magic force. It is the thing that optimizes everything. You know, you, even if you're building computer programs, use genetic programs, because natural selection is the master force that's going to just lead you to the best results. Now, you know, in a sense, natural selection or some analog of that is kind of what's being used to train neural nets to do this, to do that. But it's a much messier business. Um, it's a the whole business of sort of finding the optimum in these kind of collections in these large spaces of possibilities is messy. And you can get things that in practice work decently. But it isn't the case that one can realistically say, gosh, in the last uh, few billion years of uh, two, three billion years that life has been on Earth, Look, it's managed to optimize itself perfectly. And we, us humans here, are the results. We are the perfect optimization of life. Well, no, I don't think that's a that's right. Um, and I think that it's a, it's an infinite frontier, actually. That's not something where there's a, a sort of a limited thing. It's a computational irreducibility story, but it's also and it's also a story of where the organism that is that there will always be a fitter organism that's always kind of doing, having more computation built into it that allows it to succeed against some other organism. It's, a, it's an infinite race, so to speak. And I think that the, um, but this idea that, oh, biological evolution just gives you the optimum and that's all there is to it, um, that idea was very prevalent for a long time. I think it's sort of decaying now. Um, uh, this is a discussing whether PCE can tell you a general theory of what natural selection can and cannot do. In a sense, natural selection is a very non-program oriented thing, usually, because natural selection tends to, even though it operates at the level of the discrete genome, it tends to, for the sake of having organisms that don't die, it tends to do things gradually. It will gradually lengthen one bone, shorten another, those kinds of things. Now, sometimes when you lengthen one bone and shorten another, you go from an organism that walks on four legs to one that walks on two legs. And that's a big qualitative change, <clears throat> which as a consequence of that sort of gradual calculus level change of the structure, you end up getting this kind of qualitative change in the actual behavior. Okay, more about um, oh, whether complexity can be an adaptively valued thing, um, smooth variables in biology, uh, whether why there are species, things like this. I think maybe we'll have some things to say about that now. Um, but uh, uh, that hasn't been what... Um, uh, uh, the, the NKS book didn't really have much to say about that particular issue. I think we may now have some things to say using multi-computation kinds of methods about why species exist. It's talking about entropy. Actually, that's something I should look at again because um, I haven't thought about that in, in probably 25 years. Um, but that's relevant again now that we're beginning to have a multi-computational view of, uh, of biological systems. Uh, we're talking about... Um, uh, 
the groupings of living organisms into kingdoms of phyla are typically reflections of uh, the 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 arrival of major new features um, in um, uh, in systems. Oh, this is funny. Empirical analysis of the million or so lines of source code, it's a lot more than that now. It's more like 100 times that, that make up Mathematica and how Wolfram language suggests that different functions, roughly analogous to different genes, follow an exponential distribution of sizes with a slightly elevated tail. It'd be interesting to do that experiment again. Uh, okay, we're talking about proteins here. Um, and okay, next section. Having talked about sort of the fundamental ideas of modeling and biology, I talk next about specific issues of growth of plants and animals. Okay, this is a fun section. So first thing I talk about is plant growth. Plants have the feature that kind of, they have rigid cellulose cell walls, and you know, once you've laid down a cell, you just kind of have to keep growing from there. Animals like us are kind of squidgy, and you can kind of deform things after you've, uh, when you add cells, but plants, it's kind of a rigid growth process. So the most generic thing plants do is they branch. And so there are different kind examples of branching that I show here. And one of the things I talk about is uh, an example of branching in, let's see if there's an example, here we go, in leaves. So leaves have this feature that there's quite a diversity of different forms of leaves. Um, and the question is, how do they grow? I have to tell you about this particular page at a time when I thought I was finishing the NKS book in a matter of months. It happened to be the winter of the uh, some year in the early 1990s. And um, so I, but at this page, I didn't have enough leaves. And so conveniently, uh, somebody who worked at the company lived just down the street from the Melbourne Botanical Gardens uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, where, of course, winter in, in Chicago, where I was at that time, was uh, was summer in Melbourne. And so some of these leaves, I'm I, I still waiting for the, um, um, the botanist who's going to say, how come some of the leaves were from the... Uh, you know, Chicago area. Some of them were from the from California, taken during the. I, I happened to live in California during the first year and a half or so of the, of the writing of the NKS book. I was sort of, uh, I was kind of hiding out um, uh, as a remote CEO. I started doing that in 1991, um, being a remote CEO. It wasn't. Uh, it was uh, 31 years before it became 30 years before it became fashionable, um, so to speak, or, or necessary to do that. Um, but uh, uh, so some of these leaves are Berkeley area leaves, some of them are Chicago area leaves, some of them are Melbourne area leaves. Um, so uh, uh, not well, actually Berkeley, I say because I, I visited the Berkeley Botanical Gardens. That wasn't quite where uh, where I was in California. Um, so uh, anyway, so the question is, how do these things grow? And here's a very simple model: you just grow in these branches. And what you find out is, depending on the details of how these branches branch, you get different overall shapes. And what's interesting is, those overall shapes do a pretty good job of kind of corresponding to the overall shapes. And, and what we're seeing across the page is changing the, the, uh, the, the, the sort of the angle at which branches come out. These very simple rules, very simple branching rules, do a surprisingly good job of explaining or, or reproducing the overall, the diversity and the forms of these overall shapes of leaves. So that's something where um, the uh, uh, there's sort of a question here about um, the uh, about mechanism. And I've spent a long time talking to people who study leaf growth and so on in, in the years since NKS and, and the years before. And trying to understand how does a leaf get made? For example, the, the veins, the major veins in a leaf, they get laid down, but then all the detailed venation in the leaf is actually consequent to the structure of the leaf, I think, not formative in the not determinative of the leaf. But pretty much like how in us we have angiogenesis, the capillaries form in tissue that's been produced rather than them defining where the tissue goes. So that's a sort of a little bit of a confusing thing. And I when I was working on this part of the book. I looked at a bunch of leaf buds um, when it got to be springtime. I was very excited to go and take a bunch of leaf buds and slice them open and see as the leaf is in this kind of gooey stuff, 
before it kind of emerges from the bud into the actual leaf? What is its form? And can one understand whether these kind of branching processes are happening there? So I did, um, uh, did a lot of things like that. That's arguably not the right thing to link to this page. Um, anyway, so I talked, um, uh, just looking at the notes a little bit, talked a little bit about um, the sort of history, it's quite an interesting history of studying sort of theories of biological form from Aristotle to Darcy Thompson uh, on down, so to speak. Um, then talk about the actual mechanics of, of flowering plants and cell divisions. And this sort of 0.1 millimeter length scale is a very common length scale at which sort of patterning occurs in growing uh, biological organisms. Uh, branch, branching in plants, different kinds of branching, monocotyledons versus dicotyledons, um, whether they make one shoot or two when they come out of the seed, those kinds of things. Um, the uh, uh, Okay, so now let's go back to the actual section here and um, uh, let's look at um, what the sort of whole distribution of different shapes that you get. So this is a particularly simple case where we just have one shoot breaks into two shoots. And then this picture, there's the kind of the, the, the fiducial shoot. And then uh, this image corresponds to the pattern that you get by iterating something where the, the shoots go out from this shoot to here. Okay, so for example, up here, things are very much oriented in the, the, the new shoots that are coming out are all just going in the forward direction. Whereas here, they're all going, you can kind of see there, they, they stick out precisely sideways. And so this is kind of showing the, the parameter space of the possible forms of leaves, plants, that you get by having shoots at different angles. Okay. So one of the things I did, which actually has led to a whole bunch of work, um, is I looked at the, the kind of the, the parameter space set. So this is asking if you look, um, uh, starting from the position of the shoot, you look at a kind of peephole set. So you say, at this particular position, for what parameter values do you have leaf versus not leaf? And you see that there's this very complicated fractal-like structure here. This is an analog of the Mandelbrot set. It's a simpler version. Um, I think people have called it some kind of Wolfram set W thing. Uh, that is the um, um, that is the the thing that um, you get by just looking at just this kind of uh, in in the Mandelbrot set. You're looking at these uh, mathematical iterations: z goes to z squared plus c, and so on. This is just looking at pure branching just sort of the linear case. It's a piecewise linear function that you've got here. Um, and that what, what's interesting about that is if you wonder sort of where is the where is the complexity of something like the Mandelbrot set coming from? Well, this is giving you a sort of simpler case that's also much more connected to a real uh, situation in the world. And in a sense, what we're seeing here is that biological evolution might continuously vary a parameter across this picture, but what we're seeing is that there will be in the actual morphology and the actual form of the thing that is produced, there will be discontinuous changes and often rather confusing changes, because if you're scanning through in the fossil record, kind of moving from here to here to here, you're going to see all sorts of complicated things happen in the fossil record because you're basically sampling different parts of this kind of shoreline of what's going on. So there's a there's a certain amount I discuss about these parameter space sets. It was possible to find a certain amount um, uh, of exact results about all kinds of different things about this, all kinds of conditions for, uh, for behavior in these sets. Um, and a certain amount of, of traditional mathematics can be done. Let's see, going back here. Uh, OK, this is talking about leaf shapes. And um, uh, there's a whole. Uh, language that was uh, well it comes from like 300 BC or something of what how one describes the shapes of leaves obovate you know reniform like a like a kidney shape deltoid like a delta uh, like a capital delta and so on and then what the what the outer boundary dentate like teeth uh, 
uh, sinuate, kind of like waving, undulate, and so on. So these these are things that have been been sort of well described in the in that there are uh, even from from antiquity there are kind of directories of plants by leaf shape, so to speak, that make descriptive use of these these terms. So now the question is in the actual way that one is looking at parameter space sets and asking where in parameter space does an obovate leaf live, leaf live. So we, we get to take these things which have been described for a couple of thousand years at least, and we get to be able to say, how can we make this minimal meta model that captures sort of the things that were described here? Um, let me just look here. Uh, Right, we're talking about um, how branching occurs in plants and uh, algae and conifers and all sorts of other kinds of things and, and how that all works. Um, we're talking about, I went through, already went through this, um, uh, different kinds of branching models um, and their history um, and so on. Okay, let's go back to the main section here. Um, And we're going to go on talking about different kinds of things. So the next big thing I talk about is not the overall shapes of leaves, but where do leaves show up on organisms? And so this is the story of phyllotaxis, the, the creation of leaves. And so this was another page where a lot of what was on it got eaten. Um, the uh, uh, That top row was, was all food. Um, the uh, So what we're seeing here is the variety of different kinds of uh, essentially sort of regular spiral-like patterns formed from a variety of ways in which new shoots come out from a system, the geometry of shoot formation. Okay, so turns out these are all kind of the same idea. And if you look at the palm tree, it's kind of probably the, this, the, or, or, or this thing. What is that thing? That's a, I don't quite know what that is, but um, I'm sure it says in the NKS book. Um, one thing you see is that when these when these things come out on the cactus, on the whatever it is, uh, as you go up the main trunk, the shoots come up out at an angle that's always about 137.5 degrees away from the previous shoot. Why does that happen? It's a very generic phenomenon. And I think the explanation of this phenomenon has been rediscovered by probably 50 people over the course of time, but I was one of those people. And... Uh, uh, I think the, the predecessors of what I'd done might be a little bit vaguer, but, but um, uh, this is a very simple model of what's going on. You've unrolled the, the main trunk, and you're asking, you're imagining that there's some substance, actually a plant auxin, a plant hormone probably, that every time a shoot comes out, you are, uh, you are decreasing the amount of plant auxin that you're using up some of that plant auxin to produce that shoot. And you're asking, you're saying, imagine that it diffuses around this sort of, uh, around the trunk. And you're asking, at what point do you have the maximum value of plant auxin? Because that's where the next shoot is going to come out. And so what happens is every time a shoot comes out, it produces this plant, it di diminishes the plant auxin. There's diffusion, some kind of uh, Gaussian diffusion that happens. And you're always adding up those Gaussians. And you're saying, when these shoots have come out, Where's the maximum point? So a shoot that came out right near you, you're going to be inhibited. It's like this growth inhibition type phenomenon, sort of a continuous version of growth inhibition. You're going to be inhibited on producing a shoot right near you because your Gaussian is low. But on the opposite side, you're not going to be as inhibited. And so what's happening is, essentially, you're getting a shoot coming out that's as far away as possible from all shoots that have come out before. That's the process. It's just a result of the mechanics of these hormones getting used up as the plant produces another shoot and so on. Now, it turns out it's a pretty good scheme for the plant because by having these leaves that are sort of coming out maximally far away from all other leaves, you have the minimum shade on the plant. Now, some people could look at this and say, look at the amazing brilliance of evolution. It's managed to carefully tune this number to 137.5 degrees. I don't think that's what's going on at all. I think instead what's going on is, is that this, uh, uh, this actual developmental process naturally produces this 137.5 degree angle, and it's not obviously bad 
so it's not squashed out, stamped out by evolution. Now, as it turns out, there are details of the of the model that um, uh, affect exactly how these uh, either for various kinds of forms of Gaussian, you indeed get exactly the the the, the standard angle. If the Gaussian has too little damping, you start getting more random things. But now the more more uh, more tricky question is uh, how do you get a strawberry, so to speak? Okay, there's the there's the palm tree, um, but now these different shapes of where the overall growth of the overall growing tip of the of the of the plant goes that will determine whether the projection is kind of daisy looking or whether it's whether you're looking at something that's more like a palm tree um so that's a little bit tricky geometrically but that's all those forms of phylotaxis really do turn out to be the same and 137.5 degrees is actually very sensitive it's very sensitive to what uh, whether the daisy really works, and it does work at that, at that angle, but it really, uh, as you go even a few degrees away from that angle, you have daisies that don't, don't look the way that daisies normally look. So, okay. Um, wow, okay, I forgot this page completely. Okay, so this is asking the question, once you have a growing leaf, so, so that was talking about phylotaxis, and the um let's look at the notes there um for talking about the mathematics of phylotaxis the history of phylotaxis um and how the the golden ratio arises because that 137.5 degrees happens to be the golden ratio angle um and uh talking about and sometimes you see in, in the beginning of a plant starting to grow that hasn't quite locked into this kind of uh, pattern of, of uses of the plant auxin and so on and so it'll, it'll have some some shoots that come out alternately on either side and there's some plants that just do that but um it'll it'll sometimes at the beginning the top of the shoot where the, after the plant has grown it'll look like that and then it will go back to this uh, kind of golden ratio type behavior it's showing something of the correspondence between fibonacci numbers and golden ratio um okay we're talking about here about shapes of cells and other things like that. Boy, there should be an easier way to go back to um, the actual chapter. Well, anyway, let's go back here. Ah, no, that's showing the actual notes chapter. It's not what I wanted. Um, okay, so the next thing I talk about here is uh, how things fold up. So this is something where you have growth of cells, and you say the cells grow equally at all places. Here you have more cells growing on the outer boundary. Here you have many more cells growing on the outer boundary. Basically, a material that, that um, where more things grow on the outer boundary will curl themselves up like a lettuce leaf. And needless to say, that's how lettuce leaves actually work. And this is a phenomenon that you start seeing in, in, in cases where you can fold and bend uh, biological tissue is you can see this thing where there's sort of excess growth on the outside and that leads to this uh, kind of lettuce leaf like structure okay growth differential growth big uh, lots of biology is, is the result of differential growth this is a horn uh, if it is not growing equally on both sides it goes straight if it's growing more on one side than the other it curls itself up and uh, you know, eventually you get those those mountain goats that have very multiply curled horns. That's because one side of the horn is growing faster than the other side of the horn. Um, so now, big example of that. Now, by the way, I might say that in working on this section, I uh, really got interested in like how does everything grow? How does um, you know, you look at an organism, you know, I've looked in aquariums, zoos, all that kind of thing. I spent a bunch of time visiting those kinds of places and trying to look at these organisms and just ask the question, how did it grow that way? How did it end up with the form it has? Not, uh, you know, what were the progressive steps that got it to that pattern of growth, that, that, that result? Okay, so another big case that I studied was mollusk shell growth. Mollusk shells, a bit like plants, have this feature that they grow on the outer boundary, and once they've laid down what they've laid down, it's it's all solid from there. So, for example, if you're a nautilus shell and you want to grow out and get bigger, your only choice is to kind of spiral outwards. You don't get to 
do something like what what us animals, well, what the inner little animal would do here, um, you which is to just add more cells in the interior and just squidgily push things out. This rigid shell, you can only add to the boundary of the shell. So these are some cases of different kinds of um, uh, um, different kinds of um, uh, of of growth. These are differential growth. Uh, of, of uh, the slightly more complicated case than the horn. This is differential growth of a essentially a, 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 the opening here, and you are growing on all sides of the opening. And these are the sections through these shells. I've got some shells where I, I, um, I either did this myself or I got ones where this had already been done, where you look inside the shell and you see that, yes, indeed, that is the boundary. I should have brought some of my collection of shells to show here. Um, oh, well, the, uh, maybe another time. Okay, so here is, um, as you change the parameters of growth, you'll go from these things that don't even join up like this to these things that are quite quite flat like this, or very pointy. So, so we've got different kinds of um, uh, different, as we change the parameters of growth, we go from things which are morphologically quite different looking, um, from the pointy shells to the, the shells that look like this. And now the big question is, what about the shells you actually see in practice? Are, if you look at these different parameter values, do they correspond to shells that get shown up in practice or not? Or did biological evolution carefully tune the, the shells that uh, actually occur in nature? Or is it the case that just any parameter goes and it'll be used by some kind of shell? And I, I was very curious, this was in sometime in the um, probably late 90s, uh, I was living in Chicago, visited the Field Museum in Chicago. The uh, curator of mollusks was kind enough to um, uh, to spend an afternoon with me going through uh, sort of their collection of a few million mollusks and asking the question. We'd laid out this big sheet of paper that was essentially these, this essentially this collection of forms of growth. And the question was, are these actually achieved by organisms, by actual mollusks? And da da there are mollusks, many of those were from the Field Museum, um, that, um, uh, that indeed fill out this whole array of possible mollusk shell shapes. And it was kind of interesting because as we were finding these things in the mollusk shell drawers, there was always a story about these things. Oh, these pointy ones, they, quotes, are that way because they, they ram themselves into crevices and rocks. Or this one, it is that way because it broods its eggs in the little umbilicus here. Or these other shells are that way because. And it's a little bit weird to be saying that when you're filling out all possible parameter values. Now, in fact, um, so, so, that was, uh, so this is a case where we're saying what is possible based on the actual structure of growth of the mollusk. And it turns out most of the things that are possible based on the structure of growth um, are actually realized by real mollusks and not, not when you actually close the thing up and there's no space for the animal, little animal that goes inside. Okay, so, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm um, all right. It turns out people had studied shell growth, mollusk shell growth um, uh, in the past, needless to say. In the 1830s, there was a chap, a British clergyman, who did a pretty good job of describing um, how this works. Let's see, um, uh, Henry Mosley, that was the chap, 1838, gave a, did a pretty good job of describing this. But then in the mid-1960s, some paleontologists came along, and uh, I don't think they knew about the, what Mosley's work. Um, and they tried to do computer simulations, and they tried to sort of do the geometry of this, and they didn't quite get it right. And they thought that the parameters they chose were ones that you really can't achieve by actually having a critter that just lives on, the, on, the, on this opening and knows only about the opening, knows only the angles on the opening, doesn't know more global information about the shell. And so they ended up with these bizarrely twistable shells. And they concluded that, in fact, the shells of the Earth only occupy a small fraction of the possible parameter space. It's not true. It's a consequence of having picked a model here that does not really represent what's possible to achieve by a little critter uh, secreting pieces of, of shell. 
So the conclusion that they came to, that is that biological evolution is a force that pushes one to particular parameter space, parts of parameter space, isn't correct. What seems to be true is that essentially all parts of parameter space are realized by the system. Um, okay, there's a lot of other stuff. Um, these are sort of, um, oh, I think maybe I have a, let's see, I go back to uh, draft. Okay, yeah, so I, I talk a little bit more about other forms of growth and um, the way that uh, legs and tails and things are produced. And I talk about, this is about, um, uh, again, more differential growth, where you just say along a curve, how do you, how much growth is there? And this was, was recently studied by some uh, somebody at our summer school. Um, but it's kind of fun when you have this kind of increasing sinusoid, you get these very elaborate patterns of, uh, of growth that are the, are the curves that you get with that intrinsic curvature. Okay. Um, okay, this is talking about differentiation of different parts of an organism and uh, something which is now better understood, these Hox genes that um, where, as you have perhaps continuous variation of some, uh, of some diffusing chemical, there is a discontinuous change of what type of tissue of what genes are switched on and so on. And so this is looking at sort of a minimal model for that. And I think I had another minimal model here for this. This is discussing, you know, when do you get four legs? When do you get different kinds of, um, uh, of overall patterns of growth? This is a minimal model for that kind of thing. Um, I looked a lot at skeletons and trying to understand what would lead to different numbers of um, uh, different pieces of um, um, uh, different pieces of the organism being produced. Um, I will have to say that um, uh, the whole result of this, you know, I went from being somebody who went to zoos and just looked at the, the facial expressions of animals and, and thought how they related to people I knew and whatever else, silly things like that, to really being uh, interested in the, in the forms and shapes of animals and, and their pigmentation patterns, as we'll get to in a moment. Um, okay, so uh, talking about different kinds of um, parameterizations of biological growth, et cetera, um, and talking about, um, uh, well, pollen grains, they're a very complicated case, not well understood, radiolarians, a case that's become better understood in the last 20 years, um, uh, just uh, other, other kinds of things like this. I also talk a little bit here about animal behavior and when there are things like walking, for example, where you just have um, a sort of periodic behavior versus um, things like... Um, um, versus uh, uh, sort of um, nested patterns versus randomness and so on. Okay, oh, I'm, I'm talking um, about collecting shells here. And, and yes, I, I managed to get lots and lots of these shells. The Philippines are a great source of um, shells, particularly ones with interesting pigmentation patterns. Um, and uh, actually, we are now going to talk about that. Okay. So that was a little bit on forms of organisms and the extent to which kind of the force of growth processes, the force of the programs of growth determine the forms of these things. Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about biological pigmentation patterns. My favorite case of this is on mollusk shells, where you're essentially growing in a one-dimensional line and you're sort of laying down this pigmentation pattern, the kind of uh, the lip of the organism grow, lays down this pigmentation pattern. Uh, sometimes it's almost comical. Some of these patterns are quite simple. Some of them are quite complicated to sort of see the explanations for these complicated patterns that are of, of uh, sort of evolutionary explanations of, yes, the pattern was drawn that way by evolution. Uh, you know, why do you say that? Well, uh, that's hard to explain because the pattern that if it was relevant for predation and zebra stripe-like or something like this, uh, that mo many of these patterns are actually covered by an opaque skin during the life of the organism. So the only thing for which the, really the selection is relevant is for the shell collector, so to speak. And, and I have these shells. These are all ones that I have. I should have brought them to show. Um, this is a pretty big one that has a rather nice uh, Sapinski um, uh, thing on it you're seeing pigment or no pigment, and that's giving you the, the kind of discrete values. Now, it turns out that the big surprise is that if you just look at the elementary cellular automata, it's kind of like who expected these kind of triangle, so-called divaricate patterns on shells? 
you know, why would you, if you if you saw the the stripes and the and the and the lines here, uh, where, what would make you think that there would also be these elaborate patterns? Well, that's something which is just sort of arises in the computational universe of possible programs. It's not something that by just trying to sort of engineer it starting from the underlying biology you would necessarily expect, but it's something that very immediately you see by just looking at the space of simple programs. It's sort of an abstract piece of biological theory, so to speak, that emerges. Okay, so um, uh, talk about whether it's natural selection or whether one's just sort of randomly selecting different kinds of, um, uh, different kinds of patterns, and then only if they're not disastrous, then they're kept. But the, the patterns themselves, it's not a detailed thing that their form is evolved. It is that they are picked, sort of almost all possible patterns are picked, and uh, large swaths of them survive. Okay, this is patterns on animals. Um, these pictures were in many cases rather painful to get. Um, lots of uh, uh, me complaining that the animal is a fine animal, um, but it has a, a stupid expression on its face. We gotta get another animal. Um, but in any case, lots of interesting kinds of patterns here on that cuttlefish, um, sometimes simple ones like on that panda. Um, you know, I have to say, as I say, my, 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 my world of going to zoos was much enhanced by this, noticing that, you know, the spots on the body of the, of the cheetah here are much uh, further apart than the spots on its, on its head and its tail even further apart, and realizing that meant at some point in the cheetah embryo, um, the, all the spots were equal distances apart, 0.1 millimeters actually, typically when they're first formed, but this means the body of the thing grows more quickly um, after that stage of, embryo, em, uh, of embryonic development than the head of the thing. And that's kind of an explanation of that. It's kind of showing you the metric on the growing cheetah. So the question is, how do these kinds of patterns form? And this is kind of a discrete version of uh, re reaction diffusion equations, which are, Alan Turing studied these. This is, a, again, a phenomenon that's been rediscovered a bunch of times. But basically, the point is that purely having uh, sort of the growth inhibition story, again, this does not require the full reaction diffusion equations with continuous PDEs. It's just a simple cellular automaton. You, again, get this kind of uh, striping pattern. And uh, here, as a function of parameters of kind of the, the of the cellular automaton, how far you essentially have a growth inhibition. If the things um, are far away, you it will uh, produce uh, more another piece of pigment. If it's too close together, it won't. And as a function of those parameters, you go. You know, this is the all black animal. This is the all white animal. Um, and in the middle, you get these things like this elaborate labyrinthine kind of pattern of, um, uh, of, of pigmentation. So, and this is, I guess, this is the um, anisotropic version of that. This is the zebra version of that. And uh, I even, um, uh, my wife, many, many years ago, got me a, a zebra skin rug at an auction. And um, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm rather allergic to it, but and I'm also rather unhappy about the the origin of the uh, the the um, you know what what became of the zebra whose whose rug this is. Um, but uh, one of the things I was interested in is is do you have um, you know are the different um, sides of the zebra are they the same? Do they have the same pattern? To what extent is there determinism in the forms of these patterns? Okay, just a quick look at some of the um, uh, of the notes here. Let me see about animal coloration, um, about uh, uh, let's see about reaction diffusion processes and their history, um, about uh, uh, scales. Okay, scales are a discreteness on on organisms, and I'm talking about pandas and anteaters and all sorts of fun things like that. Um, and uh, the um, um, uh, um, then I'm talking about other examples of this kind of reaction diffusion process and these uh, spiral wave formations and so on. Also, just cellular automata. People might have thought you needed the whole PDE apparatus to see these kinds of things. You don't. Just these simple, discrete cellular automata cap 
to the essence of this phenomenon. Um, talking about maze-like patterns, talking about this question about origins of randomness, uh, identical twins have slightly different fingerprints, all these kinds of things is all rather relevant these days for uh, biometrics. You know, do the do the creases on your hand are they are they something that is epigenetic and are they something that is are they something where identical twins will have the same ones? To what extent are different kinds of forms uh, things that are determined by the actual uh, uh, growth of the organism versus by its genetic uh, kind of um, uh, structure? Okay, final thing, and so that was a little bit more about. Uh, uh, growth of plants and animals, pigmentation patterns. Um, there's kind of looking at this question of whether the main force of these things is this, or these fundamental phenomena of, uh, uh, of simple programs and what they do with the kind of core NKS phenomena, or whether all the details of whether it's a, this kind of cell or that kind of cell are what's important. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to look here at, um, so, so that was, um, it was something where I considered it a big success of the kind of NKS approach that we were able to get so far with very simple models to explain some of these things, which were in some cases the, the wonders of nature, so to speak. Okay, final section here is about financial systems. Uh, I wasn't super happy with this section, but financial systems are another place where there's plenty of randomness. The, uh, the stock price um, will, you'll see randomness in a stock price People had been interested in applying the kinds of things I'd done in cellular automata to um, uh, um, uh, to financial markets, and I was curious to study that. I, I considered back in the in the early 1990s. I thought about taking a, a six months off and as a kind of a, a sabbatical and um, uh, basically making a hedge fund. Um, the um, uh, it's, um, but I never did that. I'm happy I didn't do that. Um, it's, uh, I think those things are, there are many details and they take years and years and years to do. And um, my interest is, is more in new ideas than in, um, uh, in, those, kinds of, um, in those kinds of activities. But um, uh, I think that the, um, uh, although they have plenty idea of ideas in them, they're just uh, not the same kinds of ideas that I think form the trunk of kind of human knowledge in the way that I, I like to think the things I do try to try to contribute to. But anyway, this whole question about what happens in a market, and for example, even when there's no, some people sometimes say, well, the randomness of the market is because there's always new information coming in from the outside, exogenous information. But the, the, the sort of the NKS idea would be there's intrinsic dynamics in the market that leads to randomness in behavior. And I think it's become much clearer over the last 20 years that there's an awful lot of intrinsic dynamics in the market that has nothing to do with exogenous forces and economists and financial people that have often pointed out to me examples where there's no new information from the outside world, but merely the dynamics of the interaction of traders leads to some complexity of behavior. And I did a bunch of experiments actually uh, some sort of experiments, actually, even in, in stock trading and so on, of looking at what happens when you perturb a system in a certain way, when there's no new information, and you just see what um, uh, what the behavior that that is produced there. And, and no doubt there are hedge funds that make use of uh, essentially just this kind of idea to, um, uh, uh, to predict things about the market. I talk here in general about sort of laws of human behavior, what one can expect in, in terms of that. I talk about Zipf's law, uh, a commonly identified sort of generic law. It's very common to see power laws in human kinds of activities. Um, this is kind of a story of a, the, 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 a typical case is the nth most common word in a language has frequency uh, roughly, uh, you know, some something one of roughly one over n. Um, and this is kind of a story of, of rather simple reasons why that might occur um, and rather sort of kinematic reasons why that might occur. Motion of people in cars. I, I did a bunch of work on this and I never really got anywhere. And then years later, or not so many years later, actually, um, the minimal model of road traffic flow that people made turns out to be a simple cellular automaton, rule 184. So uh, that's something that... Um, uh, and in fact, quite recently in a, in a project that our company did, we came up with a, 
a, a better model, a better sort of generic minimal model for road traffic flow. Unfortunately, not yet, hasn't yet seen the light of day, but hopefully will in, in not too long. Uh, I've talked about city growth here, talked about, okay, this is randomness in markets, the capital asset pricing model and all kinds of things like this. Um, speculative markets, uh, I could add to this. I talked about railroads and the uh, tulip bulbs, 1630s railroads in the 1800s. Uh, okay, to internet businesses in the late 1990s. Okay, this this is still dated by, by saying, by talking about only that speculative market and... Um, um, and not um, uh, cryptocurrencies or anything like that. Uh, okay, talking about efficient markets, uh, details of, trend, uh, of trading, and cynics might suggest that much of the randomness and practical markets is associated with details of trending for much of the money actually made from markets on an ongoing basis comes from commissions on trades. And if prices quickly settle down to their final values, fewer trades would tend to be made. Uh, that's that's a sort of a, a curious um, idea. Okay, this is talking about models of markets and um, uh, and what kinds of things one can do along those lines. Uh, and that's that's about it. Um, so that was a tour of um, chapter eight of NKS, and I kind of have to had to rush through there. I didn't see um, too many questions on this. I, there was a question about camouflage here. I actually did look at camouflage, and I think there's a section about camouflage in the notes of uh, in the NKS book notes. Um, and uh, so just to survey here, that the, the basic point here is, to what extent is it true that these minimal kind of program-based models um, really do manage to capture the essence of what's happening in lots of everyday systems and seeing between growth of crystals, breaking in materials, fluid flow, biology, even finance, uh, I would say great success in this idea that these simple models based on simple programs can capture the essence of what's going on in these various kinds of systems. So chapter eight was really a seed for just a huge amount of work to be done in exploring these kinds of systems and using these sort of new primitives that arise from simple programs as a way to model and understand those systems and to make technology based on those systems. Chapter eight was intended to be a seed for those kinds of things. I'm happy to say a lot of work has been done um, in these areas since then, and hopefully in the uh, uh, for our 20th anniversary kind of version of um, the um, of the online version of the book, we may be able to link to some of the subsequent work that's been done in these kinds of areas. But um, that's the story of chapter eight of, of uh, NKS. Um, next week, we will tackle chapter nine called Fundamental Physics. I would say that um, uh, we're really discussing the, the prehistory of what's now our Wolfram Physics Project together with some other aspects of fundamental physics. But that's, um, that's for next week. And I think um, uh, that's it for, for now here. And for those who follow live streams, I'm actually going to another kind of day job live stream about Wolfram Language Design right now, which I am a bit late for. So thanks for joining me for this.